So, this is it. This is it. We're going to talk about the World Cup. Now, first of all, any of you expecting this to be, and then England played the United States, and then, and then, there'll be none of that. There will be very little actual football talk in this, and I'm going to tell you why right at the start. The thing that has really upset me about Qatar is that we went from being resistant to the idea of this World Cup ever existing. It's an abomination. Qatar should not have been allowed to host it. The acquisition of the rights to is mired in scandal. As we'll see, they didn't keep a single solitary promise, and yet no one is even talking about that now. They didn't yield an inch on any of the human rights issues. And because, incredibly, we probably got served the best World Cup since Italia 90, some are even claiming the best of all time, people are now just going to want to talk about the football. And the whole point was we were meant to be ignoring this. It was meant to be the forgotten World Cup. The world was meant to stand in solidarity and say, okay, a football tournament did occur in 2022, in winter of 2022. But uh, we're not going to talk about why or how or who or where. And now we've got Messi winning a World Cup. Now we've got all these goals and all these games, all these epic encounters, all these underdog upsets. And so people are, people are doing the one thing you should never do about this World Cup, and that's talk about the football. And I'm not going to talk about the football. I'm going to talk about things around the football. I'm going to talk about all the bad things that happened. And I'm going to try and do it in a very loose, chronological order. So let's start. Let's get into it. So just days before the World Cup started, somewhat embarrassingly, FIFA wrote to all of the teams and said, focus on the football, not ideological or political battles that exist. This was uh, Gianna Infantino, uh, who you will be seeing a little bit more of uh, to, in this uh, broadcast. But this is where they wrote a letter to all of the team saying, please do not allow football to be dragged into every ideological or political battle that exists, which somewhat is kind of overselling what people were concerned about. For those that don't know, the issues with Qatar are pretty straightforward. It's not like there's some sort of incredible detailed political battleground going on, is there? No, what there is is uh, they used um, slave labor to build these stadiums and then lied about the amount of people that died in the terrible working conditions. They don't treat women equally to men in their society. They have outlawed uh, homosexuality and any sort of support for those individuals. This is not every ideological and political battle is uh, not to mention by the way just the multiple ways that they violate human rights in other regards N not to mention the way that they treat journalists we should be appalled at any wealthy government that refuses to sort of engage with generally accepted standards in the global community it's so it's not every battle but that's what all the teams were told uh, they were all told uh, that uh, they they had to respect Qatar and respect their beliefs. This is what the letter said. At FIFA, we try to respect all opinions and beliefs without handing out moral lessons to the rest of the world. One of the great strengths of the world is indeed its very diversity. And if inclusion means anything, it means having respect for that diversity. No one people or culture or nation is better than any other. This principle is the very foundation stone of mutual respect and non-discrimination. And this is also one of the core values of football. So please, let's all remember that and let football take the center stage. Infantino says everyone will be welcome in Qatar, regardless of origin, background, religion, gender, sexual orientation or nationality. Keep that lie in the back of your mind for later. So I do want to say uh, I don't agree with Infantino there. I think there's something is sick. There's something sick with a society that would kill gay people. I think there's something sick with a society that insists women be um, covered from head to foot and uh, not allowed to engage in all the same rights and privileges as men. So I, I don't know, maybe that's like a hugely controversial, bigoted statement to make in 2022. You never quite know where anything stands. But that's how I feel about it. 
and also i think any government that would suppress journalists and have journalists harmed or killed or imprisoned for writing unconvenient truths i think that's sick and not part of what a uh, a, a good society would be doing anyway there's a lot of people reacting to the letter you can see they added here there are some concerns from certain fan groups about going to qatar because same-sex relations are criminalized qatar have tried to claim that the laws aren't enforced but they still exist while this letter does say that everyone will be welcomed in qatar regardless of background religion culture sexual orientation and nationality those assurances aren't enough for fans who believe a tournament shouldn't be held in a country where same-sex relations are criminalized it has been an issue in the build-up to the world cup and it has changed how fifa will award tournaments in future so this is something that future hosts will be assessed for in terms of their lgbtq uh, legislation i'll also add of course even gary lineker twat for hire he went in, straight into it as soon as the world cup was coming to an end and uh, as we, we, I might bring up the report a little bit later, because again, this, remember this is chronological. But basically, said, "Oh, we're we're complaining about having a World Cup in Qatar. Well, what about having a World Cup in America? That's where we're going to next, and that's an incredibly racist country." Yeah, I don't think those stadiums uh, are going to be built with slave labor, Gary. There was an interesting article in Spectator as well. Obviously, Macron, everyone's favorite French uh, world leader. Uh, you can't actually see that there, so whatever. We'll skip over that part. But basically, what it was saying was Macron uh, couldn't uh, criticize Qatar because obviously there were some uh, financial dealings. In fact, basically, Macron has had sort of all kinds of, you know, ties and done business deals. Uh, with Qatar. I'll just read you an extract from that Spectator article. Uh, it was never likely that Macron would speak out against Qatar hosting the tournament because to do so would be politically awkward. It is France, after all, which is, according to former FIFA president Sepp Blatter, ultimately responsible for the World Cup being staged in the Middle East. Uh, for the first time in its history. Blatter, who was president when the decision was made in 2010, recently alleged that then UEFA president my, uh, Michel Platini swung the vote in Qatar's favour on the orders of Nicolas Sarkozy, who was president of the Republic at the time. Platini denies the allegation, although he has admitted that he attended a lunch at the LSE Palace with Sarkozy and the then Qatari Crown Prince, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. So yeah, I was just having dinner with the Qatari but that definitely didn't influence my vote in any way shape or form uh sarkozy never asked me to vote for one country or another he said platini but i got the impression he supported qatar then this is also worth noting uh, although he didn't directly address blatter's allegations sarkozy accused some of his domestic critics of hypocrisy particularly those on the left it wasn't he said sarkozy who sold 24 fighter jets to qatar in 2015 but his socialist successor francois hollande uh, he also reminded the interviewer that while the mayor of paris and hidalgo has spoken out against qatar's hosting in the world cup the paris city council is very satisfied that the qatari zone and finance the capital club PSG and of course that is another elephant in the room isn't it that Paris Saint-Germain the uh, wealth one of the wealthiest clubs in the world and certainly um, the most successful French club in modern times is funded by the Qatari government directly it is also worth noting that Macron has to essentially be supportive of Qatar and not speak out against them because in September Qatar signed a 1.5 billion dollar investment deal with Total Energies that that will give the French energy company uh, a 9.3% stake in the Northfield South Gas Project, which reputedly contains 10% of the world's known natural gas reserves. The partnership aims to increase Qatar's liquefied natural gas production by more than 60% by 2027. LNG is regarded as a cleaner alternative to fuel, oil and coal, and this will help facilitate France's energy transition and help them meet their carbon footprint targets. So... There you go. Turns out, money. Money, money, money. At the heart of it all. And that is why you didn't hear Macron piping up about 
anything. Uh, there was also news Qatar won't allow cooked kosher food or public Jewish prayer <laughs> at that. Uh, the event so it wasn't just lgbtq people that were having issues out of, of representation out there they said that absolutely anyone that required uh, kosher food they wouldn't they wouldn't allow it uh if you wanted to uh, uh do your you know prayer ceremony as a practicing jew then they weren't going to allow that uh this came out uh, sources in jewish organizations told the jerusalem post that qatar broke yet another promise one where they explicitly said they would allow jewish prayer services in doha during the games but they uh, claimed that it couldn't secure this type of activity and so banned it completely we were promised to be allowed to create prayer spaces in order for religious jews who came to see the games to have a place of worship a representative of a jewish organization said we were recently told that they banned places of worship for jews because they cannot secure them and again for the catering needs they were promised to be able to cook kosher food including kosher meat but at the moment have only been told to sell cold bagel sandwiches instead so this is uh, another one of the many, you know, broken promises that we're going to get to. But uh, the idea that you're not allowed to pray because we can't guarantee that it's safe for you to do so. Not really a great look, guys. Uh, probably, probably not something you should uh, say out loud. Um, then, while all this was going on, obviously the British fans started to land. And uh, thanks to Jace, I believe, for this clip from a Finnish, Finnish coverage of the Brits abroad playing um, against Iran there are uh, problems with you know human rights and so forth yeah well, they don't bother us we're not interested in human rights we are but while we're here you just gotta get on with it aren't you so not bothered about human rights they said um you just you just gotta get on with it haven't you lads just gotta get on with it lads i mean obviously we are bothered but you just gotta get on with it lads so that was uh uh, a, 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 <laughs> that was a great little clip there now right about the same time everyone was filtering into qatar all the north fc fans uh that was when infantino that we saw from earlier who had told everybody to sh you know shut the fuck up about human rights gay rights all of that stuff and just focus on the football he gave one of the most ridiculous perplexing speeches uh ever given by any public facing official and also just said we're all a bunch of hypocrites in the west we're the hypocrites oh okay do tell me more today i have uh, very strong feelings i can tell you that Today I feel uh, Qatari. Today I feel Arab. Today I feel African. Today I feel uh, gay. Today I feel disabled. Today I feel uh, a migrant worker. I'm European. Actually, I am European. Not just I feel European. I think for what we Europeans have been doing in the last 3,000 years around the world, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years before starting to give moral lessons. So if Europe, if Europe would really care about the destiny of these people, of these young people, well, then Europe could also do, as Qatar did, create some channels, legal channels, where at least a number, a percentage of these workers could come to Europe, low revenues, but give them some work, give them some future, give them some hope. I really don't understand, or have difficulties to understand this um, criticism. I think we need to invest. It's, it's really simple, mate. In helping these people, of course. I will come back to that. 
we need to invest in education to give them a better future, to give them more hope. We should all educate ourselves. And whilst many, many things are not perfect, <laughs> I'll say. reform and change takes time. It took hundreds of years in our country. This moral lesson giving, one-sided, it's just hypocrisy. So I wonder why nobody recognizes the progress that has been made since 2016. It's not easy every day and every day to read all these critics for decisions which have been taken 12 years ago when nobody of, there, of us was, was there. And now everyone knows that we have to make the best out of it. And we have to make the best World Cup ever. ever. And Doha is ready. Qatar is ready. It will be the best World Cup ever, of course. I don't have to defend in any way whatsoever Qatar. They can defend themselves. <laughs> Certainly. Defending football here. Qatar has made progress as well. I will come back to that. Because I feel many other things as well. Of course, I'm not uh, Qatari, I'm not Arab, I'm not African, I'm not gay, I'm not disabled, I'm not really a migrant worker. But I feel like them, because I know what it means to be discriminated, to be bullied as a foreigner in a foreign country. Today, I feel sick. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Um, yeah, basically, the entire premise of the speech seem to be saying that because of the many crimes committed by various european nations such as obviously you know the the british empire the conquistadors etc etc that means that we shouldn't take a stand for human rights in the here and now because we should be apologizing for the next three thousand years for our sins now listen i'm happy to have a philosophical conversation about what atonement would look like for conquering nations. I'm more than happy about it. I remember I'm an individual that supports the idea of reparations within American society for African Americans that whose lineage was, you know, a result of the African slave trade. I just don't think that the average poor working class taxpayer who had nothing to do with it and whose family never participated in that trade should be the people who have to pay for it. I think it should be the industries that got wealthy off the slave trade. I think we should take a long hard look at the clothing industry. I think we should take a long hard look at private prisons and things like that. Yeah, they should certainly be paying big fat chunks of reparations to African Americans. I would sign off on that today. And if you can make a compelling case, uh, yeah, banks is another one. No, banking uh you know and the way they've discriminated against black people historically listen i'm all about it right i'm all about it and if you can make a similar case if you can make a similar case for uh, the british empire that that compels moves me i absolutely would what i will not say is you shouldn't turn a blind eye to human rights violations in the here and now <laughs> be just because your country will historically have violated somebody's rights somewhere <laughs> along the way that's nonsense, Infantino. That is an infantile way of thinking about the global community. While Infantino was giving that speech, there was a story in the British tabloid, The Daily Mirror, an absolutely horrific story where a gay person that had fled Qatar it, uh, told a harrowing tale of how they were hunted, hunted by the Qatari police and then raped by the police officers that tracked them down. Just absolutely awful. You have that as a juxtaposition to what an Infantino was talking about, about making progress. This, this is not 
ancient history that this was a report uh you know right at the start of the world cup that came out so i i don't know what you want to say like these are the types of horror stories that should be being highlighted and people should be very mindful of when we talk about the progress that qatar has made anyway as i said fans were arriving and one of the things that you uh, may or may not be aware of was the uh, there was this concept of fan villages fan villages this were little temporary living areas for fans to come over and stay while they were supporting their particular team because certain teams went to certain stadiums but the problem was a lot of these were sort of cobbled together at the last minute and so when you think of Qatar and you think of opulent luxury uh, that wasn't what people were getting I'll just bring up the pictures for you so you can see there it is there that's the fan village see you again they said still being built as people rolled up on the tarmac this was one of the big screen viewing areas it's actually worse than the Gowles Fan Fest, isn't it? Just out there in the in the middle, just in the middle of I, I don't even know. <laughs> don't worry though, there, there was there was a, a seating area, <laughs> um, some makeshift sofas had been deployed, uh, so you could have a sit down and a relax if you if you wanted to. And once once you got tired and you wanted to head in after a night of partying without alcohol uh, you could certainly go to one of your tents uh complete with a welcome mat left outside so these were the fan villages there was lots of reporting around the fan villages and just how sort of spectacularly underwhelming they were well i'll just show you this before we got the bbc reporting this was another example from inside a fan village of the type of bedroom and these these bed this this was not cheap accommodation people were paying hundreds of pounds for this this is what you got inside one of those tents that's how uh you had to live and it was about i don't know 300 pounds or something a night and yeah to be fair the fan was uh the fan looks great doesn't it <laughs> that'll keep you cool I had one of them blasting in my face when he had COVID, actually, so uh, it can speak for their efficacy. Uh, this was uh, the BBC Sports coverage. They went inside a fan village, and you can see they included uh, some of the pictures from different angles that I've shown you. Uh, you can see here, this was uh, this was £175 a night. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, okay. For me, it's no good experience. And you're gonna walk away having spent that much money? Yes. Well, I'm an eternal optimist, but the pessimist in me is kind of winning at the moment. As we've driven in, there are loads of cranes, loads of people at work, and some of the structures. We've got this brown one in front of us now, and it's clearly not finished. You can see the diggers. Uh, it's nice. It's a little bit uneven under under foot. But it's comfortable. Uh, we have a fan. We not no air condition. No. No, no, Sorry. just a fan. Parox for the door. So this is security. Yes. <laughs> well over a million people are due in Qatar for the World Cup. Anyway, uh, there's there's some other little bits and pieces as he goes on. He interviews a bunch of fans about whether or not they uh, are gonna are willing to stay. As you saw in the little preview at the start, some fans were like, you know what, fuck it, I don't even care that I paid. I'm not staying here, and they uh, got up and fucked off. So we get to the get to the start of the games. Fans are turning up, and uh, this was one of the headlines here. You can see after all of the promises that you were going to be allowed to you know there weren't going to be any discrimination against gay people you know uh, against trans people anyone wearing uh, a rainbow uh, was having their uh, you know clothing confiscated the, the welsh team the welsh fans had put together like a rainbow particular rainbow hat these were being confiscated on the way into the welsh games in the stadium they were just being taken off people uh, but it wasn't just uh, the hats uh, as we'll get to uh, in a moment and see here the well they did interview a welsh fan that had a hat confiscated just 
to show the verification purpose. You can sort of uh, listen here. This was ITV News. We were aware while we were queuing up that there'd been some rumours about people wearing the rainbow bucket hat that was obviously a symbol of the um, LGBT rainbow wall in Wales. It had their hats taken off them. So, you know, clearly I wasn't going to take my hat off and um, I think some of the other fans were aware that that was likely to happen. And then when we got through security, um, some of the security guards said that um, we had to take the hat off. And when I asked them why, they said because it was a banned symbol and that we weren't allowed to wear it in the stadium. And um, I pointed out that FIFA had made lots of comments about supporting LGBT rights in this tournament and that as a, coming from a nation where we, we're very passionate about ensuring that there's equality for all people. I wasn't going to take my hat off. Um, and I know some of the other fans filmed parts of that as well, but then they were insistent that um, unless I took the hat off, we weren't actually allowed to come into the stadium. We had to go and leave it in a sort of lost property area. Um, so we were basically forced to go back out of the stadium and then take it to a lost property area. Um, but I think I had a little moral victory in that I managed to sneak it in um, and who knows, I might even wear it during the game and see where we go from there. So, making a complete mockery of everything Infantino and what FIFA had said, uh, yeah, it was people having rainbow hats uh, confiscated and it wasn't just people having rainbow hats confiscated, uh, if memory serves me correctly, this link should be obviously as we'll get to um a sad tweet but this is the now um sadly deceased u.s journalist that uh, focused on soccer for them uh, grant wall who passed away in qatar as we'll get to but he uh, was wearing a rainbow t-shirt and was uh, refused entry because it's not a not allowed but there was other weirdness when is a rainbow flag not a rainbow flag well this is a brazilian uh that traveled to the event a brazilian reporter and they were holding up flags of their home regions for like their uh, states that they have in brazil and because of the color of the state they assumed it was some sort of gay or trans rights flag and they were denying the Brazilians entry to their for flying their regional flag. Pessoal, eu tô nervoso aqui, tô tremendo de fato porque a gente tava cadê? Aqui. Desculpa, pessoal, desculpa. A gente tava com a, com a bandeira aqui de Pernambuco, por favor, abre aqui para mim. A gente tá aqui com a bandeira de Pernambuco, tá? E e algumas pessoas tô aqui com alguns voluntários, ela é de Recife. Desculpa, eu tô tremendo, porque fui atacado por alguns integrantes aqui do, do Catar, pessoas com essa roupa e também policiais, porque eles vieram pra cima das meninas achando que era uma bandeira LGBT, mas na verdade é apenas a bandeira de Pernambuco. E aí fui filmar e eles pegaram meu telefone e só devolveram me obrigando a deletar o vídeo que eu fiz. Eu só consegui meu celular de volta porque eu deletei o vídeo que eu fiz. Isso é um absurdo porque a gente tem a autorização da FIFA para filmar absolutamente tudo. A... So, yes, Qatar, they will uh, never understand uh, as well. Uh, but this is the ridiculous lengths they were going to to make sure nobody saw a rainbow at all. Uh, and totally at odds with everything they had promised totally at odds with uh, everything that um fifa had said just in response to the t-shirt being confiscated this is a uh, i believe a public official from qatar he said as a qatari i'm proud that we confiscated uh, this, or rather prevented this person from entering the stadium with a rainbow on his t-shirt. I don't know when will the Westerners realize their values aren't universal. There are other cultures with different values that should be equally respected. Let's not forget that the West is not the spokesperson for humanity. Um, yeah, I guess... I guess we should uh, uh, we should remember that, right? Now you will also remember that uh, England uh, were going to wear the like many teams. They were all going to wear the One Love uh, band, right? That was the big thing. They were going to wear the One Love uh, LGBTQ rights uh, armband during their games. 
and England particularly made a massive deal about it. Um, Southgate had said that uh, it was something they were definitely going to do, uh, while also simult simultaneously saying if they didn't do it, you shouldn't hold anything against any players that don't want to make political gestures. Meanwhile, players that would, uh, if an England player refused to take the knee, uh, I'm pretty sure he'd be out of the England squad, but uh, it's okay, Gareth, that's fine. You just live in your fucked up, little twisted, hypocritical world. More on that in a moment. But ultimately, that was the plan for many of the teams to do it and despite the fact that this was a gesture that had been talked about discussed in advance approved fifa said it was going to be okay let us not forget that part of it the news came through that anybody participating in that gesture would receive a yellow card this is uh, being reported by bayern and uh, germany a, a an account that uh, one of the football fan accounts that i follow uh, update the english fa has been told by fifa its regulations don't allow for kane to wear the one love armband there's concern that the team captain could be subject to a booking as soon as the game kicks off and this was after a report uh that the dfb had concerned manuel neuer could face consequences of the decision to wear the one love armband neuer could face not only a fine but also a possible yellow card before the japan game for breaching fifa's equipment statutes that is the cowardly and weasley way within which fifa um got around it they said oh it's non-compliance with uniform when of course what was really going on was they just didn't want you at all to offend the qatari money machine and to put it into a broader context i saw on at least one occasion i think maybe two occasions i saw players that had chains on right they were wearing gold necklaces and they were sent to the sidelines to take them off and they weren't booked and guess what that's a breach under the same statutes so why not just tank the card uh roy Keane made this point on sky sports said it showed moral cowardice if you want to make your point you only have to do it once everyone eats the yellow point made one of the most talked about gestures in the world but england being england they absolutely pussied out england wales uh, and other european nations but in particular england because i have a particular bugbear with them but yes everybody pussied out they refused uh to do it and uh they explain why here on the bbc england wales and other european nations will not wear the one of armband at the world cup in qatar because of the threat of players getting yellow cards the captains including england's harry kane and gareth baylor wales have planned to wear the armband during matches to promote diversity and inclusion a joint statement from seven football associations said they could not put their players in a position where they could face sporting sanctions we are very frustrated by the fifa a decision which we believe is unprecedented said the statement the governing bodies england wales belgium denmark germany the netherlands and switzerland said they had written to fifa in september informing them about the one love armband but hadn't received a response fifa has been very clear that it will impose sporting sanctions of our captains wear the armbands on the field of play we were prepared to pay fines that would normally apply to breaches of kit regulation and had a strong commitment to wearing the armbands however we cannot put our players in a situation where they might be booked or even forced to leave the field of play well what a fucking what an absolute abomination from the top down really for fifa to ban this gesture is sickening but on top especially as they will allow other gestures um as we'll get to and uh, obviously for the teams collectively to show this moral cowardice and to say that listen we don't want our players getting booked in other words we are going to put our chances of winning the tournament ahead of the gesture we want to make absolutely reeks of moral cowardice and it, it, all the more insane is england went and took the knee now listen i absolutely am fine with anybody wanting to make any gesture they want you realize it didn't go along with all the right wing crazies who are like colin kaepernick shouldn't be kneeling <laughs> colin kaepernick shouldn't be kneeling in the nfl america gave him everything there shouldn't be political gestures in nfl games now rise and support the troops da, 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 da nonsense of course you can do what the fuck he wants right stand for an anthem kneel for an anthem do whatever you want here's what i can't abide why do english soccer players still take the knee right when nfl players no longer do it why do english soccer players do it they say they do it because they want to champion racial equality 
and that it's a, to protest racism everywhere. It's not just about the police brutality issue it was in America. It's become now a gesture that we've adopted in England, in English soccer, to basically say, right, we're, we are against racism. Do you think that maybe doing it literally on the ground of a stadium that was built with actual slave labor where the indentured servants that built that stadium worked themselves to death and were selected very much along racist lines do you think maybe at that point the gestures kind of lost a little bit of its potency yeah i think it has and when you say, but we're still going to do the uh, government, the governing body regulated and Qatari mandated protest against racism, they'll allow us to protest like this. But, you know, we're not supporting the gays today. Once you do that, just don't do anything because you just look like a fucking hypocritical bunch of dickheads. That's like just the fucking reality of it all. You know, like, like there is probably a dead body in the foundation of the stadium, just some itinerant woman worker that was worked to death so the, these rich qataris can pretend for three weeks that they're a good nation they're just like the rest of the world and yeah look see we have football so we we, we must have human rights as well right so they can buy your cultural capital and influence and you're gonna talk about racism there in that environment come on mate have a fucking word but anyway they did say they were going to take the knee, and uh, and did. It became a bit of a issue. A few people are against footballers taking the knee in general. I'm not one of them, but some people are against it as a gesture. Some people say it forces footballers into a show of solidarity with the Black Lives Matter organisation rather than the Black Lives Matter concept as a movement. That's been raised as an objection. Some people, gammons mostly, duh, well, you, what you're doing it for? Like, what's your politics, yeah? I don't really have any truck with that either but as i pointed out there is certainly some hypocritical questions around the gesture now and also keep in mind it's no longer mandatory to do it the players association in the premier league have said they will only players will only take the knee on special occasions like cup finals and as we see international outings but a minister uh, robert uh, Gen jenrick was questioned about it he's a cabinet minister in england and he said it was perfectly legitimate for england players to take the need to protest against inequality. Robert uh, Jenrick, the immigration minister, said he had no issue with England players taking a knee, a protest that emerged from the Black Lives Matter movement, but which is used by footballers as a more general condemnation of prejudice. I'm fine with that, he told Sky News. I think that's a choice for Harry Kane and the team, and indeed for Wales as well. These are their choices. If not for, It's not for the government to tell them what to do. And I think when you're playing in a country like Qatar, which does have different standards in the way it treats, for example, the LGBTQ community, it's perfectly legitimate legitimate for the england or the welsh team to make that stand that stand not the stand specifically for lgbtq people obviously much like macron there's probably a reason why politicians in the uk don't really want to get embroiled too much on the whole qatar issue uh, there was a report in the national about how the uk was supporting the qatar human rights abuses uh, by exporting 3.4 billion pounds worth of weapons to the government these uh, numbers were pulled from a campaign group against the arms trade uh, which i'll i'll just delve into here it says here these numbers do not relate to the value of items actually sent because that is never public information but what they refer to is the uh, the value specified in export licenses issued by the government which means the goods could have been exported in full in part or not at all uh, so in other words the, the british government reserves the right to export them we may have already exported them a little bit parts all but the bottom line is where we we have, have put aside the correct paperwork to send qatar 3.4 billion pounds worth of weapons which isn't really any any better but there have been 138 unlimited value licenses approved since 2010 including for aircraft cannons missiles and rockets the figures show an unlimited value license mean it is not possible to know how many of the goods were exported or how much they are worth caat collected the data from the quarterly reports of the uk export control joint unit which are published publicly by the department of international trade the value of these licenses jumped dramatically in 2022 
reaching a new high of 2.6 billion pounds that year alone so yes in 2022 the year of the world cup the uk government just so happens to increase its weapons exporting to the qatari government and then sits back in its fucking armchair smoking a pipe drinking a cup of tea and saying oh what will we do with these rascally qataris how very british of us loris as well came and, and said he will not wear he specifically put his name on it he broke ranks from the rest of uh, the people and said look i'm not going to wear a rainbow armband at the world cup this is a report in the guardian the france captain hugo Lloris has hinted he will not wear a rainbow colored armband with a rainbow heart designed to campaign against discrimination during world cup games in qatar france the defending champions were among eight of the 13 european teams going to qatar who in september joined the one love campaign which started in the netherlands FIFA rules prohibit teams from bringing their own armband designs to the World Cup and insist they must use equipment provided by the governing body. Before we start anything, we need the agreement of FIFA, the agreement of the French Federation, Laurie said. Of course, I have my personal opinion on the topic, and it's quite close to the French Federation president. Now, the French Federation president, Noel Legret, uh, previously had said he would prefer that Laurie did not wear it because he doesn't want his country to lecture others. Um, the only Frenchman... That doesn't want to lecture other countries about how they behave. <laughs> we found him, guys. We've we've actually found, like, incredible. They do exist, apparently. When we are in France, when we welcome foreigners, we often want them to follow our rules to respect our culture, and I will do the same when I go to Qatar, quite simply, Laurie said. I can agree or disagree with their ideas, but I have to show respect. The English reaction to the news they w were being told, essentially coerced into not wearing the armband, uh, was one of uh, frustration, they said in a statement. Uh, this is very frustrated England and Wales back down over the One Love uh, armband. FIFA has been clear they will impose sanctions uh, as national, f blah, blah, all of the statements from earlier. Virgil van Dijk was also upset over the criticism people gave the netherlands who were the progenitors of the campaign itself uh for backing down you can see here virgil van dyke hits back criticism over one love armband row he says here the captains were instead moving to wear fifa approved no discrimination armbands uh which uh, of course didn't feature any specific lgbtq iconography i play in a position where ye a yellow card is not useful said virgil van dyke i became a football player and i want to play these kinds of tournaments we just want to play football i would have loved to play with that band but not at the expense of a yellow card Oh, there you go. Tricky, all these values. <laughs> Having all these values. Anyway, the follow-up to that was <laughs> somewhat outrageous. Qatari officials said the One Love Armband sends a very divisive message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that 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 message of inclusion and loving everyone regardless of their sexuality very divisive very divisive uh this is the head of the world cup organizing committee says he sees a rainbow armband as a protest against islamic values you can see here the head of qatar's world cup organizing committee has accused teams who wanted to wear the one love armband at the world cup of sending a very divisive message to the islamic and arab world hassan al fawadi's comments came as the uk sports minister stuart andrew said he would wear the rainbow colored armband at the england v wales match on tuesday the conservative front bencher who is gay said it was really unfair that fifa had threatened sporting sanctions at the 11th hour against seven european teams who were planning to wear the anti-discrimination symbol in Qatar forcing them to protest in other ways I want to show support and I was delighted to see that the German minister who attended a recent match has worn it I think it's important that I do so uh, however Thawadi the secretary general of the supreme world cup committee for delivery and legacy what a fucking body that is uh, said he had an issue with the armband because he saw it as a protest against Islamic values and an Islamic country hosting a major event if the teams decided to do it throughout the entire season, that is one thing, he said. 
when asked if he felt nervous about armbands. But if you're coming to make a point or a statement in Qatar, that is something I have an issue with. And it goes back to the simple fact that this is a part of the world that has its own set of values. This is not Qatar I'm talking about. It's the Arab world, he added. For the teams to come and preach or make statements, that's fine. But what you're essentially saying is you're protesting an Islamic country hosting an event. Where does that end? Does that mean no Islamic country can never be able to participate in anything? There's going to be different values and different views coming in. So for me, if you're going to come specifically to make a statement here in Qatar, or specifically address to Qatar, and by extension the Islamic world, it leaves a very divisive message. After the confiscations, uh, FIFA said, yeah, those confiscations did happen, but don't worry, rainbow colours will now be allowed in Qatar, and don't worry, it won't happen again moving forward. Uh, we've talked to everybody about it, and uh, it won't happen again. However, it did happen again. You can see this report here. An American fan wearing a rainbow armband appeared to be escorted out of the stadium before the Iran versus USA game. And you can see there, there he is, big chunky lad wearing his rainbow armband that he had obviously obfuscated. He pointed to it, and he was quickly, quickly grabbed by uh, security officials and escorted from the ground uh, it became very clear that uh, obviously fifa were not running this world cup at all they were not in charge by any uh, stretch of the imagination and um it was it was the qataris that were going to set the standards and choose what was going to happen there was uh, a little breakout moment where <laughs> there was a protester that managed to make it onto the pitch in the middle of uh, a game. Uh, you'll be able to see that here. This guy had a Superman t-shirt, Save Ukraine on the front. I believe he had the Iranian Freedom for Women on the front and was also waving rainbow colors. So he, he covered all of the fucking bases. Like, if you are going to risk your life to make this kind of pro get cover all the bases, get it all in, get it all in. Less sympathetic, uh, of course, was the new story that English fans had turned up to the England game dressed as crusading knights. <laughs> um, wow, 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 wow. And uh, were denied entry. Uh, it <laughs> were denied entry into the stadium as you might expect now uh, the problem with, with the, that particular gammon is probably doesn't even know what the crusades are <laughs> probably doesn't even know historically why he's dressed like that and both of those incidents were uh, pointed out by uh, by a Qatari sports journalist who said who were very upset about it. These gestures were considered hugely offensive, uh, and it created a bit of an incident in in the Qatari news. It said you come to our region in the colours of LGBT and the clothes of Crusaders, and when we prevent you, you search for camera footage taking on the role of the oppressed. Everyone understands that so tensions just simmering along nicely uh for the entire world cup of course uh, i do want to also say that while england were showing uh, absolute moral cowardice on the desire to support lgbtq rights it's worth noting that's a, 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 a different nation was making a much more profound stand for things that were going on uh, domestically and that is the Iranian team I mean what's going on in Iran right now is absolutely appalling there have been a full revolt against the Iranian government and its treatment of individuals uh, stemming from the beating to death of a uh, young woman for not complying with uh, sh uh, aspects of Sharia and the people have had enough and the people have been oppressed by these theological nut jobs for, for for long enough but the government has clamped down with absolute brutal force and um, has been killing protesters in the streets recently the Iranian parliament convened to pass a uh, to pass a unanimous resolution that any uh, they had I think it was up to 15,000 protesters that had been arrested or handled by security forces were going to be penalized to the fullest extent of the law which depending on offenses could include penalties in, uh, the, the, of, of, of a death sentence 
And so right now, uh, this story should be on the front page of every respectable paper. This is a major nation, a nation steeped in history, a nation that has had this back and forth relationship with the West. A lot of what's happening now is certainly on our hands, if you know Iranian history, and we're not writing about it and we're not reporting about it because much like the Arab Spring, we really don't want you to know in the West that you could revolt too. That's basically what it boils down to. The Arab Spring was like comparatively not covered at all also it doesn't really behoove us to offer our support because the governments like these nasty little dictators that oppress their people in oil producing nations or other wealthy nations mineral rich nations that western governments like to do business with as long as they have an understanding with the dictator and can get what they want the people be damned so it's an absolute atrocity that what's going on in Iran isn't being talked about more in the mainstream press. And once again, it shows the failing of journalism in general. But the Iranian players who, by the way, I mean, look, I'm not talking about the football, but they gave a wonderful account of, them, of themselves at this tournament. They refused to sing the Iranian World Cup. They stood there in silence as a protest. And obviously they were in England's group and what a juxtaposition. People too afraid to wear an armband and take a yellow card meanwhile public solidarity with the people could actually get these people killed it's true bravery on display at the world cup moments after it happened well what do you think happened back home the iranian security forces uh, unleashed by the government uh, started to threaten the families of members of the national soccer team this is it reported in cnn the families of iran's world cup soccer team have been threatened with imprisonment and torture if the players failed to behave ahead of the match against the usa on tuesday a source involved in the security of the games said the source said that they were told their families would face violence and torture if they did not sing the national anthem or if they joined any political protest against the tehran regime the players sang the anthem before their second game against wales last friday and indeed obviously after this was communicated to them the not singing protest ended relatively quickly in time for their second match but the gesture was still made the risk was still taken and uh, all credit to the iranian players uh for doing it uh, it was also deeply unpopular with the fans there because you know it's seen as breaking away from the government and yeah it was it was probably the most powerful gesture you're gonna see uh certainly at this world cup it had uh no happy endings there they were immediate as soon as they got back on the plane after they went out in the groups they were uh, being dealt with and you can see new stories such as this uh this is uh, by fief pro um the professional footballer amir nazar azadani faces execution after campaigning for women's rights and basic freedom in his country yeah just terrible things going on right there now a little palate cleanser before we uh go on the opening game was qatar and ecuador and you know one of the great things about the world cup right it's people coming together and having a good time and here we go Th there was no segregation in the fans come on he is an ecuadorian and he is here to watch the match today <laughs> نتمنى منكم يا جماعة اللي تنشرون المقطع هذا مثل ما نشرته الاشتباك اللي صار بيني بين احنا في النهاية مشجعين in the end we are only here to watch this beautiful game yes yes and vamo ecuador <laughs> yes it, we got passion makes sometimes people upset yes but we come together for sport sport brings people together Sport brings people together. It does, doesn't it? Isn't it a wonderful thing to see? Wonderful to see on the opening day of the of the World Cup, all the fans just mixed into mingled together. A Qatari fan welcoming an Ecuadorian. Think of all think of all the ways in which a Qatari and an Ecuadorian could come together. There's not many, is there? And here they are together in the opening game of the World Cup to enjoy a wonderful game of football in a wonderful, uh, peaceful uh, gesture. Unfortunately, uh, that didn't last very long at all uh once the goal started flying in for ecuador uh you can see <laughs> relax 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 
Yeah, it's funny how it all changes after a few fucking goals, doesn't it, mate? One of my favourite football accounts uh, that I follow, I know everyone on the Discord follows it. If you're not on the Discord, get on the Discord, put exclamation point Discord, get get on the Discord. But they're a reg this is a regular account we like to discuss and share. Footy Scran, what Scran is a colloquial word, word typically used in the northeast of England for to describe food. Scran, you, you can all, it can be like the noun can be uh, the verb you can scran something but look at that scran as well it's, it's very it's a great word um and so footy scran showed this is what you could get in qatar this is what a greek salad looked like this was nine pounds <laughs> nine pounds sit in the stadium enjoying your delicious nine pound greek salad and obviously everybody voted not scran well don't worry look on the bright side because obviously qatar did promise to sort of fall in line a bit more with western values so they could have the world cup and fifa went out and negotiated an incredible lucrative sponsorship deal with budweiser so i paid nine pounds for that but at least i can wash it down with a nice cold beer in the sun except no uh they went back on that promise as well uh, all alcohol sales were banned at World Cup stadiums in Qatar. They did it at the very last minute before the World Cup kind of went live and fucked everybody over. And FIFA just had to sit there and watch like the cuckold in the cupboards. <laughs> they couldn't do a single fucking thing about it. Alcohol was set to be served in select areas within stadiums, despite its state being uh, sale being strictly controlled in the Muslim country. Those in corporate areas of stadiums can still purchase alcohol so obviously the wealthy people gotta have their tipple just not the proles budweiser a major sponsor of fifa is owned by beer maker ab in bev which had the exclusive rights to sell beer at the world cup would have been hugely lucrative for them the only beer you were going to be able to buy there was brands of budweiser essentially following discussions between the host country and authorities and fifa a decision has been made to focus the sale of alcoholic beverages uh, on the FIFA Fan Festival, other fan destinations and licensed venues, removing sale points of beer from Qatar's FIFA World Cup 2022 stadium perimeters, uh, said a statement from the world football's governing body. There is good news, though. There is no impact to the sale of Bud Zero which will remain available at all of Qatar's World Cup stadiums. So you can sit there like a dickhead with a £9 salad with one olive in it and have yourself a fucking £9 bottle of fucking zero <laughs> alcohol Budweiser. By the way, there's probably a fucking zero alcohol beer that fucking tastes nice out there. I mean, I don't know why anyone would want to fucking drink it. Sounds like just a ridiculous idea to me to begin with. But it probably is this one, but it won't be fucking Budweiser, will it? <laughs> It won't be fucking Budweiser. Uh, host country authorities and FIFA will continue to ensure the stadiums and surrounding areas provide an enjoyable, respectful, and pleasant experience for all fans. Stop me if you've heard that one before. This had the knock-on effect where other sponsors were like, well, hang on, if Budweiser can get fucked over with their sponsorship deal, can we get fucked over with our sponsorship deal? And you can see multiple sponsors raised concerns or issues with FIFA about the contra uh, contracts at the Qatar World Cup, uh, The Guardian can reveal. It gives football's governing body another headache hours after it was forced to ban alcohol from stadiums, a decision that complicated its $75 million contract with the brewer of Budweiser. One representative of another major sponsor speaking on the condition of anonymity said that many partners had felt let down by FIFA in lots of ways. Yeah, you're not alone there. They also indicated there had been informal discussions about potential contractual breaches and reneging on deliverables. Everyone has a gripe in some way or form, they added. There's a lot of regrouping going on to understand what the options are, contractually speaking. You would have thought now that they uh, fucked with the money, <laughs> you would have thought that might have generated something. And hilariously as well, much like that cunt who gets his neck broke by fucking Bane, all of this prompted Gianni Infantino, who today was feeling authoritative, uh, insisted he, I am still in charge, I am still in charge. Uh, despite the fact he clearly fucking wasn't in any way, shape, or form. He said, I feel... <laughs> I feel 200% in control of this World Cup, he said in his press conference. So, uh, yeah, absolute, absolute brilliant. Now... 
There was, as well, another controversy, if you can believe it. One that did steep into some areas that may or may not have had some very unpleasant racial uh, overtones. I'll let you guys decide whether or not that is a bit of a storm in a teacup. But there was this controversy about fake fans fake fans now what do i mean by fake fans i don't just mean people who come up to me and go i fucking love you anders <laughs> you're my favorite caster they're fake fans right but i'm but what they were actually talking about was fans that were essentially paid actors who were being given money to go to the stadiums and cheer on whichever countries were playing that particular day in suitable attire and uh, to give the illusion that the World Cup had sold more and, and that it was all well represented and people weren't boycotting it in any way, shape or form. Now, I want to just give you a little bit of background here, right? Because, yeah, I certainly thought some of the criticism here was a little bit iffy and gammons were getting wild again. But here's some precedent, Well, because I've heard about this before, and I've heard about this before in Qatar. I've kept my eye on Qatar for a long, long time. And this is a story from 2014. There was precedent there. This is where they were. What they would do is they would pay migrant workers £3.50 to come in for the day and be fan of a volleyball event so when the event was filmed again it appeared more popular than it actually was uh, it made it look like oh everyone wants to be here etc so qatar has again been accused of employing migrant workers as sports fans in an effort to make largely empty arenas appear full. Around 150 workers were paid to be fans at the Qatar Open of International uh, Beach Volleyball last month, an event that the FIVB, Volleyball's governing body, said on its website had brought out the crowds. <laughs> uh, but migrants from Ghana, Kenya, Nepal and elsewhere. Remember, one of the big issues that we talked about right at the start was that when you take these migrant workers and you put them in essentially indentured servitude, they are coming from countries that just have grinding poverty. Um, and it's really, really exploitative and disgusting. But anyway, um, they work in Qatar as bus and taxi drivers for the state-owned transport company and for other employers, said they were there for the money, not the volleyball. The issue is not a new one. A survey of 1,079 Qatar residents published in January by the Ministry of Developing Development Planning and Statistics suggested that paid fans may be turning Qataris off sports. The ministry said two-thirds of Qatari survey did not attend any football matches during the previous season, and two-thirds of respondents cited the spread of paid fans as a significant factor in keeping audiences away. So it was creating this insane sort of like catch-22. They, they want the stadiums to be full, so they put migrant workers in there and paid them £3.50, right? Uh, 20 reals as it's called but because there was all these migrant workers posing as fans who didn't want to be there genuine fans stopped wanting to go and said well we're not going because of the fake fans so so the idea that it you know it hasn't happened in the past there was a lot of people going fake fans no way it's like guys you gotta know you gotta know your history about about this shit anyway it goes on to say numerous workers said they regularly make up numbers at sports events uh guitar league football games pay 20 or 25 reals they said a kenyan said he made 50 reals at a handball tournament anyway so they did so it is something that's happened uh historically going all the way back to 2014 but yeah there was um there was lots circulating on social media and you're going to see immediately why people thought this might have had a racial component to it. This is a report on Mashable. FIFA World Cup 2022, Qatar receives backlash from reportedly hiring fake fans. But here's the truth. And you can see here the Argentinian fans, the England fans and the Brazil fans. So there was obviously a, a, a strong Arab presence, right? Which, of course, could be absolutely true of any of those nations and obviously some some fans from the arab world will support a country that might not even be their own because people do do that in football don't they so mashable <laughs> the mighty mashable uh got got uh, right on it and uh said here's the truth they linked all of the videos <laughs> Thank you.
Gotta love the passion of the uh, Brazil fans uh, everywhere that they go. So, the conclusion of uh, Mashable was um, that ultimately, because Qatar has a huge number of Indian people in the workforce, you know, there's all the Nepalese people out there that we just talked about. Obviously, they're living in Qatar and um, they're, they're going to want to attend the event. And this is why tweets like this were deemed to have this little racial element of it. This Twitter account was probably the one that went viral the most. He said, uh, the World Cup is a travesty, hiring locals to act as fans to make it look like an actual World Cup. It'll ruin the serious clubs in Europe because of schedule uh, schedule fixes and injuries. And don't be surprised to find some dubious refereeing. All this shit is fake. And yeah, essentially, what he was saying was racial uh, homogeneity among the fans across all of the nations was some sort of absolute proof that they were all paid actors rather than the fact they might just be genuine football fans from who live in that country wanting to attend these events so yeah i can sort of see that angle now there was also uh i believe the english fans here Now, I will just add, probably they could have took the, they could have took the time to learn the "It's Coming Home" song. Probably would have helped uh, a little bit there, but uh, yeah, you know, they still better still better than a gammon uh, dressed in a crusader outfit, if you ask me. But you know, whatever. This was the uh, German uh, fans that were assembled, I believe. So not not a lot of um pa pa <laughs> that you, you know and, and no later hosen but again nothing there was nothing to suggest that any of these individuals uh, were paid at this there was no like big scandal that came out about it no one had any definitive proof or anything like that they did issue a statement on the fake fan controversy and said uh, it's disappointing but unsurprising uh, the Qatar organizers rejected the claims you can see here. The Qatar 2022 Supreme Committee, there they are again, the Supreme Committee. They rejected accusations that there are fake paid football fans at the World Cup after videos of Indian expats cheering on the England team in Doha went viral on social media. Some greeted the clips with skepticism, although the Guardian spoke to half a dozen supporters on the ground who said they were originally from Kerala and displayed a broad knowledge of the England team in the Premier League. Other locals have been seen chanting their support for Argentina and brazil and you know remember india yeah it's national sport is cricket they've got a growing uh passion and thirst for football over there right now i mean it wasn't you know they, they've got the indian uh premier league which was in like making all the headlines because they were getting people like del piero to go out there and be like managers of uh teams and franchises so you know it's it certainly shouldn't come as a shock to anyone that indians in a host nation of a world cup want to watch the fucking games uh, in a statement the supreme committee said it rejected the allegations about fake fans uh, which they called disappointing and unsurprising fans from all over the world many of whom have made qatar their home have contributed to the local atmosphere recently organizing fan walks and parades throughout the country and welcoming the various national teams at their hotels numerous journalists and commentators on social media have questioned whether these are real fans we thoroughly reject these assertions which are both disappointing but unsurprising hundreds of england supporting indian fans shouted it's coming home as we saw there a little bit <laughs> didn't didn't quite get the well many of the words uh, right and uh, all the tune but you know the sentiment was there um southgate is our super coach sterling is our superstar pickford is our super keeper they chanted as the england fan arrived at their five-star hotel on tuesday meaning they are true england true england fans because they're absolutely fucking delusional and not to be outdone while everyone was accusing the qataris of faking english brazilian argentinian and german fans the Croatians turned up and they were fake Qataris.
gotta be careful. I don't even know what to say. So, uh, <laughs> gotta be careful with some of those songs. You know me. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be okay. I'm sure it was all fine. Now, why don't we talk about this little story that came up. Journalistic harassment uh, was certainly ongoing. We already saw it earlier with the Brazilian journalist who was just harassed and uh, accosted for holding up a regional flag. But one story that went particularly viral was TV2 uh, Denmark, the journalist Rasmus, uh, Rasmus Tantholt, uh, was reporting on the World Cup when he got approached and security guards threatened to break his camera for reasons that weren't clear. Some people say there was someone in the crew uh, wearing a rainbow armband and they didn't like it. Some people were trying to intimate maybe they were filming in a private area. But uh, you can see and judge for yourself. And now you are us from Qatar, Rasmus Tenholt, a world that is also being used for a whole lot of criticism. How do you feel about the situation Jamen, vi kan jo vise, hvordan forholdene er lige her, hvis vi drejer kameraet. Uh, we are live on Danish Television, og uh, der kan I se, nu bliver, vi, nu bliver vi stoppet med at filme, og det er forholdene her. Uh, mister, you invited the whole world to the... You, you invited the whole world to come here. Why can't we film? It's a public place. We can film with this permit. This is the upgrade pass, and this is the uh, accreditation. Okay. We can film anywhere we want. Okay. There are only, of course... Okay. No, 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 we don't need permit. Yeah. No, no, but, 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 no, but listen, but listen, but, listen, but, listen, but, listen, but you can break the camera. You want to break the camera? Okay, you break the camera. Okay. Yes. So you're threatening us by, 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 by smashing the camera. But, but listen, sir. So that was uh, obviously one of the many journalists that got uh, accosted uh, while trying to do reporting while they were out there. So that was the thing. Also, there was just some general silliness that was also occurring. A strong uptake in the American media for essentially um, saying that uh, you can't really criticize Qatar because America's going to have the World Cup next. I already said that Gary Lineker parroted this talking point. This was one of MSNBC's pundits that said if you grandstand about human rights violations in Qatar, then we should be doing the same about uh, America. Which, by the way, I mean, listen, I'm, <laughs> I've got my views on that. Uh, but uh, let's just listen us to be a little bit more nuanced in our critiques and resist simply parroting generic orient orientalist tropes while it's fair to question and criticize Qatar I wonder if this debate is truly about migrant workers rights and human rights or is it, it is. that European countries who view themselves as the guardians of global soccer for their own selfish economic purposes can't stomach the idea that an Arab Middle Eastern country will host this venerable global gathering I wonder Americans if any known of for these caring American about the Middle East, pundits by the way. grandstanding about human rights will call for the U.S. to be stripped of hosting the 2026 World Cup for the way elected leaders in this country and our judicial system in this country have rolled back reproductive rights or are trying to ban the word gay in public schools or even ban books. That's not no one is accusing the U.S. of trying to sports wash its anti-women, anti-LGBTQ, anti-book policies. And perhaps Europeans should set a better example of how migrants in their own countries are treated. More than 24,000 migrants have died trying to cross into Europe since 2014. Nuance and context matter. I mean, just on that point, yeah, we when they arrive, we don't literally put them in fucking work programs and force them to build football stadiums until they drop dead from heat exhaustion. And now some have accused Russia, China, and Qatar of sports washing. To suggest Russia doing... and China, which have been accused of war crimes and genocide respectively, yet who are both allowed to host the World Cup and the Olympics, are in the same camp as Qatar, is dubious and disingenuous. Luckily, the fans arriving in Qatar to watch the World Cup have been smart enough to make that distinction that so many Western pundits have failed to make in the run-up to this tournament. Yeah, that's uh, that's real great stuff. By the way, everybody did protest Russia and China. You might you might want to pull up the tape on that one. Uh, okay, this was what Gary Lineker had to say as we got to the end of the tournament. So uh, this is uh, as it was reported uh, by the Mirror. 
Uh, you can see here Gary Lineker, uh, Brands USA, extraordinarily racist in comment talking to his world uh, on comment on the World Cup 2026 uh, co-hosts. Uh, Gary Lineker has branded the United States uh, an extraordinarily racist country um as attention begins to turn towards the 2026 world cup which they will co-host lineker has been skating in his criticism of qatar uh not true i wouldn't uh, describe uh as scathing he's also was more than happy to go out there and cover it and um fucking <laughs> take the money he said uh lineker has been scathing in his cr criticism of qatar we're hosting this year's uh, edition of the tournament the match of the day host has frequently taken aim at their numerous human rights abuses the treatment of lgbtq community and the deaths of migrant workers the usa will co-host the next world cup alongside canada and mexico with america set to hold 60 of the 80 scheduled games Lineker famously devoted his opening monologue to this year, of this year's tournament to blasting Qatar for its human uh, rights violations. And yeah, this is what he had to say uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, we pointed facts out at the beginning of the tournament. Those facts remain. So lots of people were killed do it, uh, doing the stadiums. Yes, the stadiums are extraordinary, but at a great price homophobia is an issue here women's rights are a little bit of an issue here for me it was all uh, it was always really more about the corruption side of it because as i said previously i think pretty much every country including our own has got issues and we're off to america in four years time with canada and mexico but obviously america is an extraordinarily racist country so there's always issues but it was more the fact that we just pointed out a few facts so there you go. And just on that note, there was a good little primer, a good little explainer of why Qatar had become so problematic and why there was so much uh, lack of criticism over it uh, on the BBC's coverage uh, there. Certainly not one that went out on the broadcast, but on the website. I want to talk about the football. On Thursday, Gareth Southgate announced the England squad that he'll be taking to Qatar. The Men's Football World Cup is a week or so away. And normally at this stage, we'd be entirely focused on the squads, the tactics, the soap opera of it all. Not so much this time. On Monday, the former head of FIFA, Sepp Blatter, said that holding the World Cup in Qatar is a mistake. The World Cup with 32 teams is a big, big organization which needs also a big country. Qatar is too small to do that. Also on Tuesday, a Qatari World Cup ambassador described homosexuality as damage in the mind. Qatar says everyone's welcome at the World Cup, but the furore has been growing this week. And one question keeps coming up. How did a country of three million people with summer temperatures above 45 degrees where homosexuality is illegal, get the tournament. Qatar has never qualified for a World Cup, let alone hosted one, but that would change in 2010. The winner to organize the 2022 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. That decision was taken by FIFA's executive committee. And in 2014, one of those who voted, Michel Platini, told the BBC why he chose Qatar. And I decide that it's time that we go in one part of the world, they never receive the World Cup. I am for that, is my conviction. That was one reason FIFA chose Qatar, but there may have been others. Ahead of the vote, two of the committee were excluded after a Sunday Times investigation alleged they'd offered to sell their votes, something they denied. The remaining members chose Qatar over the US, which had been the favorite. Then in 2011, the Sunday Times reported that two other members of the committee had been paid one and a half million dollars each to vote for Qatar. They denied it. Days later, an email leaked, and in it, FIFA's then general secretary refers to Qatar's official on the voting committee. He writes, he thought you can buy FIFA as they bought the World Cup. Jerome Valka would say afterwards, that didn't refer to bribes. But by 2012, a FIFA inquiry was underway. People focused on the winners, right? Um, but how did that process go? And did anyone in that process violate the rules? Now, that inquiry would conclude that the votes hadn't been bought, but it did find 
potentially problematic conduct of specific individuals as part <laughs> of Qatar's bid. And by this point, it emerged the FBI had been investigating FIFA for years. In response to a US request in 2015, Swiss police carried out these dawn raids in Zurich, where FIFA's based. The FBI declared that undisclosed and illegal payments, kickbacks and bribes became a way of doing business at FIFA. Though that wasn't a specific reference to Qatar getting the World Cup. We do though know that 11 of the 22 committee members who took this decision have for various reasons been fined, suspended, banned or indicted since then. Two of them were convicted, but not in connection to Qatar. And 12 years on from the vote, Qatar denies doing anything illegal or unethical. But this week, Sepp Blatter had more to say about this. Of course, it was also about money, he says. That's a <laughs> reference to countries, not individuals. He hinted, without evidence, that a sale of French fighter jets to Qatar may have been eased by negotiations over the World Cup bid. That link has not been established, nor is it uncommon for the awarding of large sporting events to have a political dimension. But this is the man who ran FIFA at the time, implying that the decision may have been connected to selling military hardware. And we should also remember, as the BBC sports editor Dan Rowan puts it, that Blatter's time in charge of FIFA became defined by corruption. And so, while the FIFA corruption. and Qatar continue to deny doing anything wrong, the players are preparing to travel to the tournament. And questions remain about why it's being held in Qatar. So um, you can, I, I, I urge if you want a good primer on it uh, and you don't have time to, you know, dig into it, this article here will give you everything, uh, the entire history of the bid and everything uh, indeed uh, that you would need to know um, about it. Uh, so yes, uh, but that is pretty much it all in a nutshell. Um, you will, of course, famously remember the Richard Lewis show uh, was covering when the when Qatar uh, got the World Cup. We did a whole episode where Sam and I tried to talk about how they were going to handle the heat uh, because it wasn't clear that they would be moving it to w to winter at that time. And we were talking about warm to cold converters. Well, they actually did create the best ever uh, warm to cold converters, uh, which is hilarious because um, one of the things that Qatar is claimed is that this World Cup is actually the most environmentally friendly uh, World Cup that there's ever been, <laughs> which doesn't doesn't make sense uh, by any uh, stretch of the imagination. So the ad, the the official ad was essentially like, oh, it's going to be the most carbon friendly of all you can see here it turns out that uh, it was actually three times what they estimated fifa had basically said because climate change uh, affects us all that it was super important that the qatar world cup was able to uh, have a sort of carbon you know low carbon footprint for the event and that was certainly one of the considerations when they absolutely didn't uh, pick it for bribes you can see here climate change affects us all the earth's climate is changing due to human activity football is not immune to these significant changes and we all need to reduce the emissions that enter the atmosphere fifa fifa world cup qatar 2022 llc and qatar's supreme committee have, co have committed to reducing and offsetting all carbon emissions related to the FIFA World Cup 2022. Here's things you can do. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Like, we're, we're, by the way, are running this outrageously needless exorbitant sports uh, fucking tournament in a country where it's so hot, we're going to have to use unbelievable amounts of energy to keep everybody cool. Uh, but here's things you can do. Turn off a light. Eat less meat. Stop having holidays, dickheads. Ridiculous. But anyway, you can see they come up with this distribution of emissions. There's your boy, uh, Gianni Infantino with his little penis head. But of course, it's all lies, like everything else about this World Cup. Um, apps, it's just all fucking nonsense. There was a, a report that came out that said not only is the claim that it was going to be carbon neutral wrong... It was also going to be one of the mo one of the highest uses of carbon at any World Cup or any sporting event of all time. 
Um, and so people said it's dangerous and misleading and, and you really should change it. Uh, FIFA said the Qatar World Cup would have a footprint of 3.6 million tonnes of equivalent, equivalent carbon waste, which would be offset by all the initiatives around the World Cup. We did a little digging into FIFA's carbon footprint estimate, and we think it's actually over 10 million tonnes. So three times that at least, uh, said uh, one of the people looking at this at Lancaster University. And let me tell you, those warm to cool converters, they, they were working a treat. An absolute treat. It was actually reported that people were complaining about being too cold. <laughs> Shocked World Cup fans complained stadiums are too cold despite 30 degree plus heat due to Qatar's revolutionary air conditioning just pumping it out down there. But you can see uh, Qatar built seven air conditioned stadiums for the World Cup to combat the desert heat. But after the opening game between Qatar and Ecuador, some supporters said they were too cold. Temperatures at the Al Bait Stadium peaked at 23 degrees Celsius, with the coastal location adding a cool breeze around the ground. But one fan commented on the windy conditions and saying that it was closer to 20 degrees Celsius, regardless of the weather. And also, Mario Sanchez, a 33 year old US fan, said it actually feels kind of cold here tonight. So there you go. Super warm to cool converters. Now, while it was clear that uh, there was lots of things going on in terms of messaging, protests, what you could not couldn't say, what was going on, very few players were talking about it. A lot of, the vast majority of players fell in line and just said, look, we're just here to play football. I just want to play a World Cup. Can I just play the World Cup? Please leave me alone. You see here, this is over in uh, Sports Bible. Uh, you can see Jan Vertonghen was one of the few players to kind of speak out about what it was like to be there. Uh, and and he said, um, here's what it feels like being in Qatar. I'll just uh, play it. Um, the last gag, as, as you in, in, in I mean, too late. I don't know if you make a statement now by wearing the armband now. That would mean punishing yourself. And, but now I'm unfortunately afraid to say anything at all. I don't feel comfortable about this. And that is telling enough, I would say, that we are put in uh, on the spot in this situation. I'm, I'm, you know, afraid if I say something about this, whether or not I'll be able to play on the field tomorrow. That is unfortunately a situation that I've never, ever experienced in football. And I hope I'll never, ever have to experience it again, because it's just not good. And we are being controlled and I don't really like making political statements but as I said I'm afraid to even say something about this we're here to play football and if we can't even do that by you know because we're making a statement and we're just saying normal things such as no against uh, racism and discrimination if you can't even say that well hey then what uh, then what indeed? Uh, afraid and controlled. But well, on the subject of people being censored and afraid and controlled, well, it wouldn't be complete without talking about our old friends in China. They made some uh, interesting edits to their World Cup broadcast because they censored shots of World Cup fans not wearing masks in the crowd <laughs> because obviously china at the moment if you know anything about what's going on in china uh, china has this zero covid policy that's still f meaning people are being locked up in their buildings and being treated in like appalling conditions being subject to like rigorous testing all the time all sorts of you know freedoms being stripped away and so going out there <laughs> the chinese footage that was being shown because obviously in qatar people were just maskless and yeah, we're all watching the football. Yeah, there was no fan shots uh, being put into Chinese TV. Uh, you can see here the phrase football is nothing without fans has become so accepted as to be cliche among some commentators. But Chinese state TV has been testing that assumption to its limit throughout the World Cup. On Monday, as Ghana beat South Korea in a classic World Cup clash, subtle changes to China's coverage of the match ensured viewers were not exposed to images of maskless supporters and to a world moving on from COVID restrictions. There was also some discrepancies around the reported numbers of people in attendance 
after we lurched out of the fake fans controversy, now Qatar was reporting a, a number of fans in the stands that couldn't possibly be there based on the capacity of the stadiums, which, of course, were all tracked uh, for years. They were quick to explain that uh, discrepancy. Uh, here we go. Uh, World Cup 2022 attendances. FIFA explained why they're higher than the stadium uh, capacity. Uh, see here. In the opening two days, these have been the attendances and the reported stadium capacities. Qatar versus Ecuador, 67,372 in a stadium that can only hold 60,000. England versus Iran, 45,334 in a stadium that can only hold 40,000. Senegal versus the Netherlands, 41,721 uh, in uh, a stadium that can only hold 40,000. USA versus Wales, 43,418 in a stadium that can only hold 40,000. Well, FIFA contacted uh, Rachel Burden, the journalist, and said, I've just been contacted by a FIFA spokesperson who's told me capacity figure is the reference capacity that meets the FIFA requirements. The final capacity during event mode is higher, hence the mismatch. Well, what does this mean? Um, so FIFA originally tweeted out the official stadium capacity of the eight arenas, and they were higher than the officially listed attend l listed uh, attendance. But the original capacities were like all built on the spec of the stadiums. So they also did their announcements based on tickets sold rather than actual fans that turned up. So these discrepancies, oh, no, don't worry about it. It's all good. Uh, loads of fans, all the fans are here. Look at all the tickets we sold. Go bleed and blimey, governor. USA Iran was always going to be a contentious game. There was uh, a bit of friction in the press huddle before that match. Well, as you'll see here, uh, one journalist took exception to, well, f um, among other things, his pronunciation of their country as Iran. Iranian people, but you're pronouncing our country's name wrong. Our country is named Iran not Iran. Please, once and for all, let's get this clear. Second of all, um, are you okay to be representing a country that has so much discrimination against black people in its own borders? And uh, we saw the Black Lives Matter movement uh, over the past few years. My apologies on uh, the mispronunciation of your country. Um, yeah, that being said, you know, there's discrimination uh, everywhere you go. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned, especially from living abroad in the past years and uh, having to fit in in different cultures, is that in the U.S. we're, we're continuing to make progress uh, every single day. I grew up in a, in a white family with an obviously an African-American heritage and background as well. So um, I had a little bit of uh, different cultures and I, I was very, very easily able to assimilate in different different cultures. So, um, you know, not everyone has that, that ease and uh, the ability to do that. And obviously it takes longer to understand and through education, I think it's it's super important like you just educated me now on the pronunciation of, of your country so um yeah it, it's a it's a process i think is as long as you see progress uh that's the most important thing so uh an incredible classy and and well articulated response from tyler adams a very Im impressive figure and uh, honestly uh you might sort of be cheering that on on the surface of it a, a difficult question being asked of an american in a press conference however uh, there's always more to it than meets the eye yasha ali did a thread sort of breaking down why th why this you know question occurred in the manner in which it did and obviously uh, there are a lot of countries that use uh, american social problems they send journalists out to events to ask questions about those social problems and what it's really doing is they don't care about racial equality in America they're doing it to essentially distract from their own issues and use the old classic yeah but what about you though what about you though what about you though so um, you can see here Yasha Ali, who has returned uh, to Twitter, removed his catfishing picture and has started tweeting again regularly, uh, a bit more like how he used to uh, before he became absolutely full of himself. So, you know, good job. I want to point out that this journalist is from Press TV, which is directly controlled by the Islamic Republic. What people need to know before they cheer on this journalist is that the Islamic Republic has a history of weaponizing racism in the USA for their own purposes. The leaders of the Islamic Republic and their followers are often incredible 
incredibly racist against black people, yet they pretend to care about racism in America. School children in Iran are taught about Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. They're treated as heroes. Uh, the Islamic Republic points to them and says, see how horrible America is. But the point is, the Islamic Republic goes against every single principle these men fought for. It's a deeply cynical move, and they have no place to talk about racism or state-sanctioned abuse. You can watch the Supreme Leader of the Islamic uh, Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, talk about the killing of George Floyd and the protests thereafter. Now juxtapose that against all the images you've seen out of Iran in the past two months, and you'll see what I mean. And I also do just want to add, as generally, this point of when you correct people's pronunciations of things, like, is it disrespectful for an American to say Iran instead of Iran? You know, we're all going to mess up pronunciations, uh, you know, based on where you're from regionally. I certainly, you know, I've talked to a lot of Germans down the years and, you know, I've talked to Germans with really thick German accents and they've said that you're, you know, Wales or England. And I'm not going to correct them over that. I don't consider it disrespectful. Well, it's just good to be having you know conversation with people from different parts of the world and different cultures and different languages so seems to me that that was uh pretty needless and uh and spiteful in addition as well to the banning of the rainbow flag banning of the one love armband what happened here was there was also this slogan women life freedom women life freedom is the slogan that has emerged out of the iranian protests because as i said it was predicated as a woman's rights movement uh, in in iran and so somebody was wearing that t-shirt and the Qatari police started to harass these individuals for wearing that t-shirt and to push them away from the stadium. Um, again, any type of dissent against uh, Islamic theocracies uh, was being suppressed in Qatar. There was a, an article about it in the Iran International English News publication, which you can see here, where they picked up the story. This included uh, tapes, recorded tapes, where Qataris had said to Iran, if you give us the names of the people you don't want to be there for the World Cup, we will solve the issue for you. Of course, obviously very sinister connotations around that and this is because you know the qataris and the pro-iran regime were uh, pro-iranian regime media were all getting together and discussing what they could do while they had an opportunity to seize these people in a sympathetic country of course pierce morgan wouldn't shut the fuck up the entire world cup he just won't shut the fuck up ever will he the turbo gammon the the man who personifies the word twat, uh, decided he would do some journalizing, journalizing. He would get involved with that. And he wanted to ask some difficult questions uh, of the um, of Hassan al-Thawadi, the guy from the Supreme Committee. He wanted to get to the bottom of how many migrant worker deaths there had actually been. It's probably the only example you can think of where Piers Morgan interviews someone and isn't the most odious person uh, in the uh, in the exchange. When he was asked about it, uh, he said the estimate was around 400, between 400 and 500, and that they didn't have an exact number of the number of deaths. Now, the original reported figure uh, was 6,500 South Asian migrant workers had died during the construction of these stadiums. These numbers were disputed. They said there's absolutely no truth to them. Uh, then it was, they said about, it was closer to 50, and now we're up to 400, uh, 500. Anyway, there will be people, Hassan, who says that that's a lot of people. They'll say 400 is a price too big to pay. What do you say to that? To which the Qatari official replied, one is one death is a death too many, plain and simple. 
Every year, the health and safety standards on the sites are improving, at least the World Cup sites, the sites we are responsible for. To the extent that we've got trade unions, representatives of the German and Swiss trade unions have commented the work that's been done on the World Cup sites. I think overall, the need for labour reform in itself dictates that improvement had to happen. And just to be clear, this is something we recognised before we bid. These are improvements that we knew we had to do because of our own values, improvements that had to happen. Remember that this was meant to be a World Cup that uh, was we were, everybody said we're going to boycott it. It'll become the forgotten World Cup. Qatar should never have had it. Well, FIFA got to do their little victory lap despite all of these horrible stories uh and they announced on the official fifa website that this had generated record-breaking tv audience numbers the group stage match versus costa rica uh, uh generated the highest audience of the year in japan the la alba celeste's encounter with mexico uh had an audience share of 81.3 percent in argentina that's 81.3 percent of all people watching television were watching argentina mexico and england versus usa was the most watched men's football match on u.s television ever it broke records in multiple multiple countries and uh, did so throughout uh, the rest of the tournament and it of particular interest ahead of the world cup being held out there fifa wanted to point out that this world cup uh, has seen this renewed groundswell of interest in football in soccer as they call it over there and that boded well that uh, ahead of the 2026 world cup no lessons learned nothing changed more of the same there was also this story out of turkey <laughs> which uh is a bit of a wild one uh i got this from court offside a turkish commentator was sacked live on air mid-game while he was covering morocco versus canada uh, and and this is this is an interesting one so on thursday afternoon a turkish commentator was fired during halftime uh, the halftime of morocco's world cup group f match against canada alpa bakachigli was cover covering the game for turkish broadcasters trt which <laughs> that's testosterone replacement therapy trt uh, when hakim ziyech gave morocco the lead in the fourth minute of the game the commentator informed his viewers that the Chelsea Stars goal was not the fastest in the World Cup, mentioning that Turkish legend Hakan Şükür holds the record for the fastest World Cup goal ever scored. However, this did not go down well with the bosses, and he got replaced during the first half uh, break and was later fired. Uh, he said on Twitter, I was cut off from the TRT institution where I worked proudly for many years after the event that took place uh today separation is included in love hope to see you all again goodbye now the reason is you cannot say hakan sukur on turkish television you cannot say his name despite the fact he got 51 goals for 112 appearances for his country for he played for like inter milan he did all these like legendary things and this is because he joined a political group <laughs> that uh, was basically, uh, you know, accused of terrorism by the uh, Turkish state. Um, so he was a former member of Turkish parliament. He was elected to the Grand National Assembly, Assembly of Turkey in 2011. He'd been a, a representative of the Justice and Development Party. Then in 2013, he resigned from the position in protest over something that was going on. And then he, he, he ended up working as a football pundit back in Turkish radio in television. But in 2016, he got charged because he insulted Erdogan on Twitter and they sent out a warrant for uh, his arrest. And then he got charged with being part of the uh, Gulen movement, or I believe Hizmet is what they call it in Turkey. Now, I don't know too much about it. The Gulen uh, movement, they're like a, an Islamist group that Erdogan has deemed to be 
a, a terrorist uh, organization. It's actually deemed to be a terrorist organization by Turkey, by Pakistan, uh, by by Cyprus, uh, and probably a few other countries uh, around the world. And so because he became a part of that and it insulted Erdogan, Hakan Sukur has been completely memory holed <laughs> uh, in... Um, in fucking in turkey and if you even bring up his name if you even point out he did do those things though he did do those you can't gone fired also another recurring classic is this the number 24 <laughs> it came up again guys the brazilian number 24 did come up now this is in french so um You'll see it here. Le Brazil a utilisé le numéro 24 en Coupe du Monde pour la première fois. Et si n'est pas anondin. I can't speak French. That's all garbage. But what I will do is I will translate it for you and, and read it to you. So uh, what that uh, badly garbled headline uh, was, was Brazil used the number 24 at the World Cup for the first time. Right. When they faced Cameroon, the Salasau released a jersey which, uh, with the number 24 in it. Um, and because in, in Brazil, we all know, the number 24 has been associated with, with uh, not just homosexuality, but also inversely homophobia, uh, because people reject uh, the number. They said this was significant because the Brazilian Football Association had to explain to Qatar that it wasn't a political gesture. No, 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 we're not doing it to, we're not doing it to celebrate the gays. We're just using the number. So it's like, it's come full fucking circle. It is a jersey like any other, assured Gleese and Bremer at the start of the tournament. Except 24 has never been worn by the Brazil team during a match counting for a World Cup. We would have liked it to be a protest action like those carried out by other teams. But it is great to see that it happened anyway, said uh, Railson Oliveira, founder of Fiel LGBT, a group of supporters of the Corinthians of Sao Paulo uh, that focus on LGBT representation. And so apparently what's happened in the last few years, right? Because get this, to remember when the Brazil fans told me there was no such thing as 23 plus one, like people didn't use the 23 plus one candles. It says here, right? In the game, Jogo de Bicho, the number 24 is representative of the deer. The animal is associated with homosexuality and Brazilian popular culture, among other things, because it belongs to an animal species whose males will occasionally have sexual relations with each other. The word designating that animal in Portuguese has a similar sound to an insult, a homosexual insult, uh, so the spicy F, I'm guessing. Um, but in Brazil... Some men refuse to sit on the armchair 24 in a theater or cinema to live in the number, to live in the apartment number 24 of a building. Others even use 23 plus one candles to celebrate their 24th birthday. It's official. It's done. It's there. Just admit it, guys. Just admit it. It's actually all gone mainstream. This is so fucking mental that this literally started on by the numbers, right? But here's, here's what's really interesting, right? It's gone from being the gay number that nobody likes because we're all super macho and all of that. Now, it's been appropriated by LGBTQ representative groups. And it says there, it goes, it has gone from a taboo number to a symbol of resistance. The, t the number 24 is becoming a symbol of resistance and pride for some members of the LGBTQ plus community in Brazil. At Gay Pride in Rio last week, a man displayed himself on a with a giant Salasau, that's the Brazilian national team t-shirt, with a rainbow armband and the number 24, all in support of the Brazilian Football Federation for releasing the shirt number 24 for the first time. We feel a wind of maturity is blowing through Brazil in the sense that it is now more obvious that a number has nothing to do with someone's sexual orientation.
So there you go. A nice little recurring segment. There was a little bit of uh, priggish uh, snootiness. Uh, the Guardian, like a lot of liberal media outlets, will never resist the urge to dunk on Fox in any way that they can. And uh, this was no different. Fox had exclusive coverage because Fox Sports, spoiler, they're really good at Fox Sports. Like Fox Sports has done so much for sports coverage. Uh, they were like some of the original like people that came up with all the different angles in the nfl and different camera tricks and everything like that They're, they've had exclusive coverage and so this was an article by aaron timms now i'm like listen i'll dunk on fox as well and i'll certainly dunk on americans talking about our beautiful game right and making fools of themselves while they do so but this article i think is petty and misses the mark but we'll get into it the world cup a tournament of frenzied emotions, spectacular goals, heroic upsets and grand displays of athletic daring and skill. Or if you're watching it in the US, four weeks of shouting, relentless commercial promotion, disorienting cuts and changes of channel to make way for the college football game and segments in which Alexi Lalas, that's the former centre-back, the one who looked like the lead singer of the fucking Spin Doctors with a ridiculous unkempt ginger beard that uh, scored a header that stopped England quality qualifying uh, for the World Cup in 94. A little bit of history there for you. But anyway, uh, while Alex, in which Alexi Lalas does pump-up speeches for the US team that no one in the US team will e ever listen to. Uh, it is a global exhibition of Clint Dempsey's ongoing quest to assemble vowels and consonants into an order that resembles words and a month-long celebration of the festival that is Landon Donovan's personality. At a time when things are clicking on the pitch for the U.S. men's national team and America finally has a generation of footballers with the technical quality to challenge the world's best, there has been something faintly reassuring about Fox Sports' approach to this tournament. Whereas the USMNT is now a cosmopolitan ensemble of feather-fine talents, the Fox team is the equivalent of a Farmers League 11 that hoofs it long and hopes for the best. <laughs> Four years on... From the dumb bumverate debacle of its coverage in Russia, Fox is back and worse than ever. In a world of so much flux in which so many human connections seem so ephemeral, Fox's commitment to a losing team, squeaky Stewie Holden on the match call, Lala spouting nonsense on set, and Rob Stone holding the whole thing together with the desperate energy of a dad using his daughter's 18th birthday celebration as a showcase for his own comedic talent is something we can all get behind. From the moment that Stone called Doha Dozer ahead of the opening match between the capital of a small oil state on the Gulf and a fermented South Indian pancake, who's really insisting on the distinction, then promptly vanished from Fox's coverage for the next three days, the US host English language broadcaster of this World Cup has offered up a feast of gaffes, stupidity and unconquerable on-air awkwardness for American viewers to enjoy. The official explanation for Stone's disappearance was that he lost his voice, but it's possible he simply wandered off in search of a snack. Things are, I'm reliably told, far better over on Telemundo, but those of us without the Spanish skills to appreciate the full vocal exuberance of that channel's commentators are stuck with Fox. The only solution has been to embrace the misery. Many have taken Fox to task for glossing over the rottenness at the heart of this tournament. It's a legacy of crass over commercialization and death. But to be fair, this is not the first time that a group of Americans has blundered into a country in the Middle East without bothering to fully educate itself about the facts on the ground first. Gotta like that. The correspondences between American military adventurism and international sports broadcasting may be faint, but the Fox crew has done its best to bring them to the forefront, applying the can-do spirit of Iraq 2003 to its coverage of Qatar 2022. The acute ambivalence that many throughout the footballing world, including in America, feel about this tournament has been nowhere on display. Nuance, political context, the sense of proportion about a sporting project built on exploitation and influence peddling have all been lost amid Fox's non-stop on-air bonfire of jingoism, an untroubled uplift. Even by their elevated standards, Rob Stone and co have outdone themselves this World Cup, chuntering and blundering around their Doha base with all the charm and worldliness of a set of Bush administration foreign policy officials. 
In these circumstances, you might expect Fox's coverage of the matches, untroubled by politics, to be razor sharp. You would be mistaken. From its orientalist, this is where it starts to take the turn. You're like, okay, it's been a bit of a banger. Don't worry. It's more, it's more pettiness. It's like that uh, journalist uh, saying, don't call it Iran in the end, but we'll get into it. From its orientalist redoubt uh, on the Doha Corniche, arabesque motifs, casino lighting, <clears throat> no actual Arabs unless they're from the Qatari Tourist Agency. The Fox team has set about its task with vigour to beam all the tournament matches into the living rooms of America while being max maximally patronising to the country's soccer fans. In those rare moments when Fox is not jamming a brand down our throats, here's the player to watch segment presented by Coca-Cola. Your first half moment, sponsored by Verizon. Our player spotlight is hosted by the Volkswagen ID4. The network's hosts, analysts and match commentators seem determined to mansplain the sport as if we, the soccer watching public of the United States, have spent the past four decades with our heads in the desert sands surrounding Lucille iconic stadium. Now, you see, this just reeks of someone that's never sat down and watched American sports. Like, it's like, that's all of them. That's their own sports, you know? And also, mansplain, I don't, I don't know where you're getting that from. How can... If men are watching it, uh, can, can a man mansplain to a man? I don't know. Insults to our collective intelligence have come from all angles. The constant tedious analogies to American sports, stepovers and feints described as deeks and heezies. Is that what the fuck? Don't even know what those are. Never heard of them. Corners constantly compared to pick and rolls. Uh, the never ending quest to contextualize the world game by comparing whole countries to American states. Qatar is the size of Connecticut, we were told repeatedly on the opening day. The network's embrace and promotion of the interminable, it's called soccer cause, who cares? The strange extended segment in the run up to USA v England about how much Harry Kane likes American football. The employment of Piers Morgan as a special guest pundit. No thanks. On the field, things may be de uh, developing nicely. But off its US football, or the version of it that Fox Sports serves up to, to us every four years, seems destined to remain stuck in a permanent 1994. Forever on the brink of becoming America's next big thing. Forever hostage to a cabal of C-suite cable bros intent on translating this exotic, bewildering sport into the language of touchdowns, home runs, and alley-oops for what they see as the country's blinking, insular, Yankee-doodle millions. This bizarre cultural parochialism does a disservice to both America's players and our sizable constituency in European club football and the legions of fans on those shores whose understanding of the sport is every bit as sophisticated as anything you'll find on the terraces of Camp Nou, Anfield or La Bombonera. Take a moment to appreciate the full dizzying scope of Fox's witlessness in Qatar. After Rob Stone noted in the lead up to the group match between Brazil and Serbia that the Brazilians have won the World Cup five times, perhaps the most widely known World Cup statistic of all, a wide-eyed Clint Dempsey exclaimed, Wow, you really did your research. During France v Denmark, match commentator JP Della Camera described Kylian Mbappe as a kid who's 23 and the whole world is talking about him. Uh, an evaluation who's awestruck already suggested that JP has watched close to no football over the past half a decade. Donovan st started the tournament pronouncing Iran Iran, uh, witnessed uh, Tyler Adams being corrected by an Iranian journalist for m mispronouncing the country's name, but then continued to call the country Iran for the rest of the tournament. And again, I'm sorry, I think these are like really petty fucking grievances at the best of time. They then segue into a paragraph saying that, oh, the mispronunciation of foreign names, you can't expect an American to not fuck that up. In a big tournament, you always want your biggest players to show up, and Lalas, who often gives the impression that he's being paid by the decibel, <laughs> has not let the Fox team down this Mundial. Uh, from his post at the end of the panel, the big man in the Marga light suit has delivered his signature rants with all the enthusiasm of someone who's blown past the discomfort of knowing that no one else on set finds him interesting or funny. Player rating, 10 out of 10. In support, Dempsey has been dim but fundamentally lovable. Dr. Joe Mashnick has b brought all of the authority of his credentials as a non-medical doctor. He's only got a PhD. 
PhD and member of the Connecticut Soccer Association Hall of Fame to bear on the important task of courting verbatim from the laws of the game. And Stu Holden still hasn't stopped talking from America's opening match. Donovan, meanwhile, has pulled off the impressive trick of being both exceptionally boring and weirdly aggressive. In a sport that thrives on innovation, Donovan has developed a kind of anti-chemistry in his rapport with English co-commentator Ian Dark. It's built on dead air. <laughs> the flat effect of a benzoed accountant and negging sample own uh, from the spain v costa rica match seven nil looks like an nfl score you wouldn't know anything about that ian a special word also must go to kate abdo abdo is a great enabler of the hijinks and self-deprecating silliness that makes cbs's coverage of the champions league so enjoyable however as host of fox's world cup tonight show she had to contend with the sentient televisual own goal that is american soccer fan chad Ochichincho, uh, Ochichincho, there you go, see, it's not just Americans that fuck up pronunciation. Ochichinko, a former wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals, has for some reason been asked to document his fan experience for Fox at this World Cup. A brief that has yielded such insights as, I liked the game today, Ronaldo is my man, and 30 seconds of confused silence that consumed Ochichinko. Okachinko after Abdo made a gentle joke about Carlo Ancelotti's eyebrows. This all perhaps reveals the true genius of the Murdoch Empire's 4D chess. It's dark and accidental power. Fox's coverage of the World Cup is so bad it's become unmissable, almost as much as an opportunity to watch Mbappé blitz down the left wing or the Brazilian front five tear opposition defences to shreds. This World Cup tempts us with the fascination of Fox's abomination. Glued to the screen by the promise of another delicate Della Camera insight that's dead on arrival or a fresh Donovan dunk on dark. We simply can't look away. I'd offer more on this point, but Lalas is about to do his World Cup power rankings and nothing gets between me and my daily appointment uh, with Lexi on the Doha disco tiles. So, all in all, I think, yeah, American coverage uh, of sports is a bit stilted, but that article, I know, America has its own flavour when, it uh, when it covers sports. And I've watched some of the Fox Sports coverage. I've seen uh, Fox Sports and CBS. I've watched CBS's Champions League coverage before as well and you know what i don't think it's i don't think it's bad i think it's just different sometimes it adds an interesting little aspect to it i mean the real holy grail of course is what sky sports have going on the sheer genius of having you know roy Keane, gary neville two characters i never thought i would like if they ever went into punditry and obviously just having them and and having jamie carragher in the middle of that sometimes you know jamie jamie carragher and neville have a great partnership and pairing you know sky sports has sort of become the holy grail it's irreverent it's fast-paced it's argumentative it can get tense at times like it did over the ronaldo issue where roy Keane and gary neville had very different views about his potential departure from man united you know you're gonna have to work pretty hard to beat that yeah and micah richards has grown on me immensely as he's found his feet in punditry as well you know so that for me is the holy grail but like you know fox has uh definitely got its own flavor and and the cbs champions league games are pretty good i want to say didn't they have thierry Henry on there i think as a recurring pundit at one point uh but anyway you know put it this way you end up watching like by contrast the bbc and you just dread the fucking day that jermaine genus is going to be on in the commentary booth oh no fuck no i'll take watching fox over that any fucking day of the week right we're on the down slope now so uh we will move from the comedic tone we will pay tribute to obviously grant wall that we saw earlier wearing his rainbow t-shirt um if you don't follow Gra if you haven't followed grant's work um, obviously he's been covering soccer and worked as a correspondent for CBS. He had a really popular sub stack as well. That was, ta that was taken off and, um, he passed away in very sudden, uh, conditions right at the back end of the world cup, around about the 10th of, uh, December. And the reaction to this was so fucking indicative of everything that's wrong with social media the initial reaction was oh 
he was seen earlier not being allowed entry into a stadium so um uh, for wearing a ra the rainbow t-shirt you can see in this picture so there was an absolute groundswell immediately he must have been killed by the qataris that's, that's the only explanation and you know this was when we didn't know anything as to what had potentially happened people were hysterical immediately going to the worst case scenario which don't get me wrong i understand that his brother put a statement out saying that the the cause of death had yet to be explained and strongly intimated there could have been some foul play that didn't help things but obviously you've got to forgive uh, a man who was going through the grieving process him and his brother were very very close and um, indeed he was wearing the rainbow not just to protest obviously you know Qatar and their attitude towards gay rights but I mean you know his brother is gay and so it had a little personal aspect to it so uh then it went the other way and that was that it was being revealed that it was a heart attack of some kind and so immediately people started pulling up the tweets saying he'd been vaccinated and so you had all the fucking you know the vaccine crazies were that now attacking his family attacking his brother att you know attacking his memory attacking his twitter account um, and saying really uh, unpleasant things. And so, you know, it just went like... Ch -ch -ch -ch. It went all over the place. In reality, it was just a tragedy. He'd been ill in Qatar. Um, he'd been struggling, I believe, with a bronchial condition. And unfortunately, just had a heart aneurysm, which um, saw him die very, very quickly. The US Soccer Federation put a statement out and said the entire US soccer family is heartbroken to learn that we have lost Grant Wall. Here in the United States, uh, Grant's passion for soccer and commitment to elevating its profile across our sporting landscape played a major role in helping to drive interest in and respect for our beautiful game. It's important. Grant's belief in the power of the game to advance human rights was and will remain an inspiration to all. You know, it came after, a, as I said, a period of illness. Uh, he said... Uh, my body finally broke down on me. Three weeks of little sleep, high stress and lots of work can do that to you. What had been a cold over the last 10 days turned into something more severe on the night of uh, the USA-Netherlands game and I could feel my upper chest take on a new level of pressure and discomfort. I didn't have COVID, but I went into the medical clinic at the main media centre today and they said I probably have bronchitis. They gave me a course of antibiotics and some heavy-duty cough syrup and I'm already feeling a bit better just a few hours later, but still no bueno. You know, we don't often talk about this, but, uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about it. When you're doing live event coverage and you're working a deadline, the stress you put on your body is on on paralleled you know like i mean like you know you would like the only people probably working harder like for real are like the athletes you know th themselves you're doing all of this on no sleep you're writing you're having to like run around move around all the time you're having to talk to people take meetings get here get there get access and you're doing all of this if you're carrying an illness your body's not going to recuperate unfortunately um and i've had that many times you know i've turned up to land caught a cold on day one been doing like a week of coverage and i've you know there's just no there's no world in which you you can get better and yeah i've, I've had i've had bronchitis i've had you know coming out of an event before a very bad case of, of, of bronchitis I've had bronchitis, obviously tonsillitis, a horrific case of that. <clears throat> you know, I've, I've had all, all, just all sorts of fucking nasty illnesses, you know, coming from events and, and they've really wiped me out after an event. But, you know, good journalists don't let a little fucking bit of illness stop them. You've got to get up and go out there every day and get the copy. And, you know, Grant was a master of that. He was a prolific writer. And that's the hardest thing to do. It's hard to be good, to be good and prolific that's a rare gift indeed he was a fantastic talent i've read plenty of his work down down the years and uh, a titan of, of sports journalism that i'm sure would have had a very long and successful career with many published books and fantastic tales to tell so it's sad to see him pass away in the manner he did rest in peace uh, he wasn't the only journalist as i said as well that passed away in qatar this was uh, from the gulf times uh, the photojournalist Khalid Al-Mislam uh, passed away as well from a sudden illness that uh, took him in Qatar. Um, he was a Qatari, 
which is again, you know, uh, he was there taking pictures um, while covering the World Cup. Uh, and it says there, we believe in Allah's mercy and forgiveness for him and send our deepest condolences to the family. And so may he rest in peace also. Right, let's pick up the mood and we'll just do a few of the funny little snippets at the end. Sky Sports were doing live on the ground coverage and they remarked upon this somewhat ridiculous scene. Uh, it turns out in Qatar, they don't just race boats, any they race Ferraris. But we're seeing cars on the water, so we need to show these pictures. Uh, what is going on here? I, I didn't know, my, my cameraman turned because I went to, uh, to him, he, he's colloquially known as Gagey. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. But I said, there are Ferraris out on the water. Uh, and he then turned and had a look, he said, my word, you're right. Uh, actually, if you've got time, we're just gonna pan around it. They're, they're back out again. Qatar is a bizarre place in, in many ways. There is obviously some extreme wealth here, but this is taking it to a, a different level. There's a, a yellow supercar and a red supercar out on the water. Listen, clearly they've been adapted to be boats. The red one <laughs> clearly, can't seem to get yeah. above about two or three miles an hour, but the yellow one has been herring off at a ridiculous pace. Um, I do hope they haven't got the Croatian players in them. I'm hoping that they're in the hotel behind me getting themselves ready. Um, but yeah, there's been some bizarre things. And I think we showed you some pictures earlier of uh, a more traditional type of maritime boat here in, in Qatar with all the four flags of the semi-finalists. Argent yes, so it turns out, yeah, some of, some of those Qataris have a bit of money. And uh, they're racing not just cars, they're racing supercars that have been converted to be aquatic uh, as well. So, uh, yes, fantastic scenes there. And there was also the news, which, uh, to the surprise of absolutely no one, uh, the Welsh and English fans all received universal praise there wasn't a single arrest in qatar this is the head of the uk football policing unit has praised fans who travel to qatar for their exemplary uh behavior throughout the tournament uh, during both england and wales participation at the world cup there were zero police incidents and zero arrests to british nationals the first time that's ever happened at a world cup and i just can't put my finger on it i just can't put my finger on why that might have been the case. I don't know. There were, uh, it's a mystery, I guess. I mean, Welsh fans are never a problem anyway. We, 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 we they're, they're, you know, there might be the odd drunken fist fight. English fans are always a fucking problem. You know, you've seen them, the gammons. You've seen them. Yeah, I saw all. The, I saw the fights kicking off in Tenerife. I did see that video. Yeah, English and Welsh fans having, a, you know, showing each other some fucking brotherly love like back in the day. You know, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, this is obviously because no one was fucking drunk <laughs> and everyone was in control of their emotions and their behaviour. And also, probably the fact that you're not going to get due process in Qatar if you uh, do misbehave. You get, it's going to be potentially off uh, off with your head so just to end it i mean i said i would give you a little bit of football talk right I did say that i did promise that so here we go this was the sky sports team of the tournament uh, that they announced at the end of the tournament and one of these things is fucking not like the other right I don't really have a, a, a an issue with a lot of these names. I want to say that fucking Morocco were revelatory. Hakimi was out of this world. Uh, what a what an unbelievable like where these players like have been. Um, you know, just it, what it's just wild. Like Amrabat, Unahi, they all had just uh, they they just had amazing tournaments. Like just <laughs> really put themselves on the on on the world map. Griezmann, you know, I mean, he still makes France tick. I think I'd said on a previous stream, you know, I think France because Pat Patrice Evra. I don't know if you saw this. Patrice Evra said, <laughs> "If we win this World Cup, we will win the next one and the next one." Because we have such potential and, and 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 players coming through, and I'm like, you've got Mbappe, sure, and you have got some other good young players, but the problem I thought this French team had, what I was worried about, was its overall age. 
you know, and I, I mean, Griezmann played very well, but I think I'd said in the previous stream that I had a bit of concerns that after all this time, Griezmann was still getting a game for France. And, I, I, you know, Acuna's a bit of a weird one for me. Uh, I didn't really think he was that great. I mean, Messi, obviously. Messi, Mbappe, Giroud, um, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the Maguire, obviously, well, look, and you could, you certainly make an argument for Martinez in there, although I live in Birmingham and, you know, you can tell, you can tell he's Villa because he's a cunt. But, um, <laughs> but Maguire being there is just fucking stupefying. Like, what? Like, Varane? Like, no? Like, like it, it's... It's just unbelievable. I mean, I put it this way. I know everyone said he played really well at this tournament. But let's also be real. He made a ton of mistakes in the group stage games, right? He also made multiple mistakes in the playoffs. I mean, he did make mistakes still. It wasn't as bad. It wasn't as bad, like, fuck, it, as, as Man United performances. But he was, abs you know, he, he was still... You didn't have confidence... My problem with Maguire is always the same. It's this. He is too immobile to be a truly world-class centre-back. He's like a relic of a bygone time. Like when you had a big guy at the back or a brick wall and you just stood there and made tackles. The game's evolved so far beyond that now, you know. And obviously, you have the additional benefit of he's really good on corners and set pieces. He's a handful in the box. Yeah, that's all brilliant, but that's some old-school bullshit, right? You have to be dynamic from the back these days. And this is every time England's fucking game breaks down, happens like this, and Maguire is stepping out of the back, and he does that thing where he thinks he's like some sort of actual footballer, Right, and he'll take the ball on, and he'll step up and step up and bring the line up, and there's no one behind him, and then he'll he, he can't pass, and so he'll fuck up the pass, and then he's got no pace, <laughs> so he can't get back to make up for the mistake he just made. That must have happened, by the way, like 10, 15 times. It, you know, it, it, he did it in the French game at least five times. Right, you can go and watch it. So he's fucking dog shit still. And to see him in the team in the tournament is an absolute fucking abomination. One last piss in the eyes from Qatar. From Qatar with love. I know, seeing him next to Gvardiol as well, it was revelatory at this tournament. was like fucking embarrassing. But anyway, there you go. That's, that's it. That's the World Cup review. We did it. We got through it all. We covered all of the stories, all of the happenings, all of the funny bits, all of the sad bits, all of the bad bits, all of the bullshit bits. FIFA's greed. We did it all. We did it all.